How did I become the recipient of the American College of Surgeons Lifetime Achievement Award? Thank goodness it is not given for scientific achievement or innovation because I have never made an earth-shattering discovery. It is given for service to the college. I have indeed given over 50 years of service to the college, but I am told that I was singled out because I encouraged so many others to become involved and brought new ideas and programs to the college. I do not view myself as anybody special. I am a girl from a poor family in rural New York who was educated primarily in public schools or through the generosity of others. I chose to become a surgeon and remained at my alma mater, SUNY Upstate Medical University, my whole career. I have always known how to be useful. I can, in hindsight, see strategies and events that caused me to follow this path of service. Although I did face bias and adversity, I did not let it deter me. The resilience to overcome challenges and the willingness to work to eliminate them, I believe, is the reason I have been honored on many occasions. Perhaps a little of the story of my life and the lessons I have learned throughout can help others. Although one cannot change one's childhood, many of the lessons I learned as a child can be taught to children to inspire them to become independent, creative, and to develop a good work ethic. As a young child, we moved to rural New York where both of my parents worked, my siblings were older than I, and my best friend became my father's aunt who lived with us. Auntie had endless curiosity. She read voraciously and taught me to do the same. She valued excellence. Each morning we did spelling words. I still get really upset when I get a red underline indicating I have spelled something incorrectly. I learned you could be perfect if you worked at it. She admired Eleanor Roosevelt and taught me to do the same. Eleanor's aphorisms still guide me. Do what is right because someone will criticize you anyway. Every day, do something that frightens you just a little. No one can take away your self-confidence without your consent, and so many more of her wise sayings. Emulating wise, successful people can lead you to push yourself, have heroes, give children inspiration. I had a great deal of alone time. I was responsible for myself. There were rules such as you have to call if you are going to be late for supper. And when you hear a car coming down the road, you need to get off your bicycle and stand by the side of the road. Pretty practical advice as only one lane of our road was paved. I knew the rules, but beyond that, I was on my own. I organized my own activities, picked out my own clothes, and earned money as soon as I could. Being allowed to make decisions and having to live with them made me thoughtful and resilient, as some choices did not work out so well. How many times did I hear, and now what are you going to do, usually after something had not gone well? The admonition that went with it was, you could have done better. Having this independence as a child was important in making me able to handle bigger challenges as I aged. When I was about 10, my father had a stroke and my sister developed multiple sclerosis. Living with them gave me an understanding and acceptance of those with disabilities. I was never shielded from the less pleasant things in life, which added to my resilience. The experience with their physicians made me want to become a doctor a choice supported by my family and teachers. Remembering the impact of my family's doctors, I try and engage children when they accompany their family or if they are the patients. I have now lived long enough to see some of them actually come through medical school. I observed that whenever our family faced a challenge, the approach was to figure out the way forward, not to bemoan our tough circumstances. The ability to problem solve stuck with me forever, and I was to face challenges. As a child, I never felt gender bias, but that came to an end when I entered college. The college had become co-ed only three years earlier and had far more men than women. I was pre-med. At orientation, the pre-med group was told that the women should consider an alternative career as few women got into medical school. With the help of the only woman on the uh, science faculty of our college, I was accepted into medical school after only three years of college. 
That solidified my already held belief that no was only a suggestion. I still believe no is the most empowering word in the English language. I learned also that academic excellence could overcome many an obstacle. The first years of medical school were not my favorite, but were a necessary evil to get to the prize, clinical medicine. A worthwhile lesson, you sometimes need to do things that are really tough or unpleasant to get to what you want. And I used to tell my patients when they were facing challenges, hang tough, this too shall pass. This too shall pass was always a family mantra and still is. During my third year of medical school, my mother became terminally ill. Her surgeons, they were smart, they were kind, and they actually figured out what was wrong with her. They were very useful, which resonated with me. Once again, my hero worship guided me on my decision, and I wanted to become a surgeon. I did not appreciate that none of the surgeons were women. And when I applied for a surgical residency, my applications were just returned. Can you imagine that? One program actually did give me an interview, and when I arrived, they said, oh, we don't take women surgeons. I could not resist saying I've never known a woman, a man named Patricia Joy. I did resist saying some other things, which was a very wise choice. I was able to negotiate a residency position with the chair of surgery, who had been my mother's doctor. Following residency, I did not have job offers, and by then, my father had also died. Thank goodness my parents had inspired independence, as at 26, I was without them. I created a tapestry of small jobs until the new chair of surgery asked me to join the department. I had never contemplated an academic job, but liked teaching and the university environment, so I accepted, then figured out how to be an academic surgeon. Research was not my first love. Teaching was. I was told by many that closing my research lab would end my academic career. I closed my lab anyway. I focused on becoming an academic educator by learning psychometrics to improve exams. If you really want to be considered an expert, you should be one. You can only fake it for just so long. Surgical education has now become a respected academic activity. The American College of Surgeons gave me great opportunities to work on a number of education projects. Just as this offer of an academic position, many of my best experiences have come serendipitously. So always look at an offer. It may turn out to be great. The two most improbable offers I received were to become associate dean and run the educational aspects of the dean's office when I was only nine years out of my residency. Another was to run for the AMA Council on Scientific Affairs. Each ended up being a really terrific experience and allowed me to do many things I felt needed doing such things as improving the early experience in medical school while associate dean and while on the Council of Scientific Affairs, assuring processes were in place to see that mammography was of good quality. I learned how to administer programs and much about human nature, both fitted into my desire to provide service. As an administrator, I learned to listen so I could understand and hopefully find a face-saving resolution to some seemingly impossible problems, such as a revered professor is no longer a safe surgeon, now what? The most difficult part was to listen to people who had a very different view of things than, and a different value system than I. This is still challenging, but you can do it. And if you really listen, you can learn things. Both of you uh, uh, can work toward a solution and you can really have a much better understanding of their problem and why they believe what they believe. You also often realize that there is an issue that has caused the problem that they're dealing with and that that needs to be addressed. Your solution was always better with diverse input. Often during difficult conversations, I would use self-talk. I have always found self-talk very helpful telling yourself that you can be patient, that you will not lose your temper, that you will be happy, that you are not tired, that you can really get that tumor out, and so many more things. If you cannot believe yourself, then who? I also learned that it takes no more work to be happy than miserable. Attitude matters. 
I really realized early that since there were no women in surgery, or for that matter in medicine, I needed the support of enlightened men. To this day, it is critical to, uh, getting, to, to getting support to get things accomplished. You can even change biased men to accept that women are capable. Learning to change things slowly but steadily helps. As the saying goes, you can even eat an elephant if you do so one bite at a time. Engaging others in your projects is helpful to their careers as well. You gain support for the things you wish to do by being trustworthy. Conversations are confidential. Gossip is detrimental. A good friend who happened to be a psychiatrist would say, it is their tale to tell. Betrayal of someone's confidence is always discovered and remembered. The growing awareness of the lack of women in medicine and the many disparities they faced became increasingly upsetting. Why should women be the ones who always get the thankless jobs and get paid less? I then attended the first Women in Academia Leadership Conference and realized that it was not just women surgeons, but that discrimination toward women was pervasive. At the end of the conference, each of us promised to do something locally and nationally to eradicate this bias. Problem? I did not know any women surgeons. So I put up an invitation for women surgeons attending the American College of Surgeons meeting in 1981 to join me for breakfast. About 20 came. I found like-minded women with problems similar to my own. The Association of Women Surgeons, which resulted, is now 40 years old and has members throughout the world. Thus began my quest for equity and inclusion of women in surgery. I felt it important for women to align themselves with mainstream organizations, which helped the American College of Surgeons be more inclusive of women. We held our meeting just before theirs and had a great program which attracted women and they would then stay for the college meeting and therefore became involved in the college. Becoming involved in education in low-income countries made me even more aware of the need for recruitment of women to surgery. Without women surgeons, there would never be an adequate workforce. I have been able to help women in many countries improve their circumstances. The American College of Surgeons gave me a great latitude in promoting women's issues and recruiting women to surgery. After all, once you break the glass ceiling, you should not pull up the ladder and patch it over. You need to widen the opening and build permanent stairs. During my work with women, I realized the value of the American College of Surgeons to surgeons throughout the world and actively engaged and recruited them. The international members are now the largest growing segment of the college. I tried to be sure that my ad advocacy was always done respectively and inclusively. I learned and taught others how to change the role and image of women. Between the uh, Association of Women Surgeons and working with the Association for Surgical Education, I realized that one or a few people can make a difference and that if you see something that needs to be done, just do it. Do not wait to be asked. You will find support if it is a good idea. Always be useful was another mantra in my family. I think that willingness to look at a problem and address it without being asked is why I have been given amazing recognition such as the American College of Surgeons Lifetime Achievement Award. Always remember to accept recognition with humility and give thanks to the many others who have helped in these efforts. Perhaps the most valuable lesson I learned was to help others attain their dreams. Whether it be by teaching and mentoring students and residents, inviting someone to join a group, or introducing people to one another, you gain more than you give. A simple thing like remembering when you introduce people to mention a bit about them may create a connection. These connections have a tremendous beneficial effect on many people's careers. You should always take advantage of the opportunity to nominate and to recommend others. Reveling in the success of others will bring great rewards and have those people want to support you. Always want those around you to be as good and confident as you. When you treat people that way, they rise to the task. When given this award, they mentioned how many people my service work has impacted. What better a legacy could anyone want? 
now nearly 80, I still have much to learn. How does one remain relevant, functional, and useful? Thank you for listening.